Okay, can somebody confirm you can hear me? Yes. Thank you. That's not where we left off. Of course, you're not seeing that yet, but uh, so. trying to go where we ended up. It's Monday, Wednesday, there's Tuesday, Thursday, okay. So before we begin, are there any questions? Close that down. Close that down. I have a lot of emails. I'll take a look after the after the lecture. Uh, let me share my screen. I guess before I share, should share my screen, I should talk about the grading. I'm in the process of finishing grading lab six. I hope to be finished tonight. And uh, what else do I have graded? Uh, I graded some other things. I don't remember what it was now, though. Maybe it was the credit study group. Extra credits. I mean, uh, lab five was graded last week. I thought I graded something else, but I don't remember what it was now. Uh, and I have done the uh, the unknown project. So uh, I did that last night. And uh, <clears throat> if you put in a request on Friday, let me remind you, you might not get anything until Monday because if I don't look at it uh, after you submit it on Friday, I won't look at it until perhaps Monday. I might look at it on Saturday. I do not work on the unknown project on Sunday ever. And on Saturday, I will maybe about half the time. Since I did look at it on Friday, this Saturday, I did not look at the unknown project. So if you submit it on, on Friday, you won't get a me to even look at it until Monday. But I sent them out on Monday for all the ones who requested a test and the test was incubated. I had enough time to incubate and then I sent the, the results. If it didn't have enough time to incubate, you're going to have to wait until I send it out again. Not sure when I'll do that. If it's not tonight, then tomorrow night. All right, let me shut down the grade book and then I'll share my screen. Are there any questions about anything before we begin? All right, we're supposed to be on chapter eight today, but we're behind schedule. And I hope to finish chapter six and then get started well into chapter eight today. Let me remind you, you do have a quiz this week on Wednesday covering lab five and six, why I'm really working on trying getting lab six graded. That is my number one goal. Uh, the quiz will also cover chapter four and the end of chapter three. For today in the lab, you're supposed to be working on your unknown project and your infectious disease paper. The infectious disease paper is due this Saturday at 11.59 p.m. There will be no lab today. There will be a lab on Thursday. Any question about any of that? All right. Let me uh, go to chapter six. I believe this is the slide where we finished talking about the different types of culture media. And we talked about complex media that uh, have many things in them. 
uh, including whatever the cow eats will be in the cow. And then when we grind up the cow and make the beef extract, it'll be added to the media. We use complex media largely for growing heterotrophs, and that's largely what we grow in the microbiology lab, like E. coli or Staphylococcus epidermidis. We do have different types of media. There's an anaerobic media, and this is important for obligate anaerobes. These are organisms that must avoid exposure to oxygen. Oxygen will kill the cells. We call this a reducing media or an anaerobic media. It contains chemicals like sodium thioglycolate that combine with and remove the oxygen from the media. The result will be a media that's oxygen depleted. And usually what we do is we heat up the media like in an autoclave, and then that drives the oxygen out of the media. And then we uh, have the thioglycolate that uh, at least on the bottom of the media, will pull the oxygen out once it tries to come in from the air above. <clears throat> As I mentioned, I talked about thioglycolate last week. When you have a thioglycolate tube, it will be full oxygen, meaning air oxygen, at the top of the tube and no oxygen at the bottom of the tube and a gradient of oxygen in between. There's also selective media. These media halt or inhibit the growth of a particular group of microorganisms while not affecting the growth of other microorganisms. An example of this is 7% sodium chloride media. The 7% salt, meaning sodium chloride, uh, prevents most microorganisms from growing. Most microbes will not grow above about 2% sodium chloride. But if it's a salt-loving or salt-tolerating organism, it can grow in 7% sodium chloride. There is also differential media. The differential media provides differences between two different organisms. The differences are not related to how well the organism can grow on the media, but you can see either differences in color or differences in the media, generally the color of the media. It makes it easy to distinguish colonies of different microbes. An example of a differential media is blood auger, where we can see differences in different hemolytic ability between the organisms. An organism that does not lyse the blood we call that gamma hemolysis. An organism that partially lyses the blood, or alpha hemolysis, and an organism that completely hemoly hemolyzes the blood, and that we call beta hemolysis. Any question about any of that? We talked about blood auger before, which is why I went through it so quickly. There are also some media which are both selective and differential, meaning they can be combinations of each other. You would never have a non-selective and a selective media together, but you can have selective and differential or differential and enriched. And I suppose you could have differential, excuse me, enriched and selective. I don't know of any, but uh, off the top of my head, but I'm sure you could have that. This is a selective and differential media, eosine methylene blue or EMB plates. They're selective against gram positives. So if you see growth on the plate, it's likely to be gram negative. Meaning it has chemicals in it that prevent the growth of gram positives. It's just also differential on the basis of lactose fermentation. If the bacteria have their normal coloration, which in this case would be white or off-white, then they do not ferment the sugar lactose. If on the other hand, they're dark, let me blow this up. If they're dark, like these colonies here, 
or they're metallic green in color, that means they're fermenting the sugar lactose. That creates an acid and the uh, lower pH changes the color of the, um, what do they call that? The, uh, the dye. There's another name for that, but I've forgotten the name of it, meaning it's a dye that changes color uh, with the pH. Indicator, that's what it is. It's an indicator. Let me shrink this down. There's also enrichment media. These organisms the, encourage the growth of finicky or fastidious organisms. Oh, excuse me. This is not an enriched media. This is an enrichment media. These two are very different. An enriched media uh, allows the growth of at least some fastidious organisms, meaning they have additives that are growth requirements for certain cells like red blood cells, and they will allow organisms to grow. Blood agar is an example of an enriched media. There's also an enrichment media, and these are different from enriched. An enrichment media is actually a selective media. It encourages the growth of desired microbes, but does not encourage the growth of other microbes. It increases the numbers of desired microbes to detectable levels. It's particularly useful if the targeted microorganism is only a small proportion of the total population. It's often used for obtaining certain microbes from the soil, other environmental uh, conditions, or a fecal sample. For example, suppose you suspect that there's a microbe causing the patient to have gastroenteritis or diarrhea or something like that, and there's lots of microbes in the feces, but you want to find the human pathogen. Well, what you can do is grow the fecal bacteria on an enrichment media and then select for the organism of interest. Um, for example, if you're trying to, to obtain phenol degrading bacteria from the soil, you could, and there's only a few of them and and thousands of other bacteria in the soil, trying to streak it out would be impossible because let's say the bacteria in the soil would be one cell in a million cells. So one species and close to a million different species. You need to streak out a million colonies just to get one colony of interest. That wouldn't be doable. However, if you took the soil bacteria and grew it in an enrichment media, for example, one where the only carbon source is a phenol, then only organisms that could degrade phenol would be able to grow in it. And so this would enrich for the phenol degrading bacteria. You can transfer one mil to uh, another flask. So let me uh, try and illustrate this. All right. So in the first tube, we put organisms in and the phenol degrading bacteria is only one, one cell in uh, 10 to the six. I'm gonna go 10 EE, which is an old way of doing it. That should be capital E though. Because I'm not gonna be able to do the hyperscript in this. All right, so let's say this enriches for the phenol degrading bacteria by a hundred times. Now that we've got it growing in here, instead of being one in 10 to the six, it's now moved up to one 
in 10 to the 4th. So one cell in 10 EE4. And that EE means that's the uh, um, superscript over the 10. Well, if we took this and put it into another two, we could enrich it once again, one in a hundred fold. We're just assuming uh, one in a hundred fold enrichment. That would bring the numbers of the bacteria up to one cell in 100 cells. And that we could streak out. It would be a lot. You'd have to streak out 100 colonies to get one of interest, but it could be done. Everyone see that? And that's what yes. you just grow it in the enrichment media after it's grown up. Uh, put a sample in another enrichment media and enrich, enrich it again. Was there go going to be a question? No, I was just letting you know that uh, we could see it. Okay. All right, so this table is giving you a, a review of the different types of media. Uh, let me uh, reiterate that a peer culture is a culture that contains only one species. We usually get a peer culture from uh, taking cells from a single isolated colony, but to make sure it's pure, and this only uh, this only makes it guarantees that it's pure and about ninety five percent or higher, meaning you might have as high as 5%, but it's probably somewhere between 0 and 5% uh, non-peer, meaning that if you were to do this 100 times, you would get one culture that's not peer between 0 and 5% of the time, meaning 0 to 5 of the 100 cultures, which is workable in microbiology. And what we do to get it that high is we will uh, get from an isolated colony, take the cells from that colony, streak it out on another plate to get isolated colonies, and then take the cells that have gone through two colony formation events to obtain our peer cultures. And we call it a peer culture, but re always remember in the back of your head, there's going to be a low number, less than 5% of the cultures that will not be pure. So even after you've streaked it out and obtained two isolated colonies, you may not have a pure culture. But most of the time you will. Like I said, it's 95% or higher that you will have a pure culture. A colony is often derived for one cell and if a colony were derived from one cell, then when we pick from a colony, you would have a pure culture. The trouble is about 30% of the colonies, or maybe even more, are not derived from a single cell. Some are derived from two cells. Others are derived from a clump of cell. And that's why when you pick from colonies that have gone through two colony formation events, meaning the cells have gone through two colony formation events, you will not have a pure culture and all the time. It'll be 95% or higher, but it will not be 100%. So instead of talking about colonies, we often in microbiology talk about colony forming unit. And that's because we don't know if a colony was formed from one cell two cells, or a clump of cells. To obtain single colonies, which is a critical part of obtaining a pure culture, you need to use the streak plate method, i.e. streaking for colony isolation. 
How you do that is you take from a stock culture or a mixed culture, and then, uh, well, you flame your loop beforehand, cool the loop, pick up the cells, and streak them on sector one. You want 20 to 30 streaks uh, through sector one, and this is actually done pretty well. And then you flame the loop. That will get rid of any of the cells on the loop. And then you cool the loop on sector two. And then you streak sector two in sector one in the low areas where the bacteria are more dilute, meaning they're going to be most concentrated where you started up here. And then as you come down here, there'll be more dilute in sector one. So in sector two, you streak from sector two into sector one, where they're low concentration, and then use that to streak out sector two. This is going into sector one too many times. You shouldn't go in more than, oh, three, at most four times. That's about five or six times. And then you streak out sector one, uh, two, and it, it's not clear to me why in sector two they have cells here, because if you picked up the cells from here, you shouldn't have any cells there because this isn't in sector two yet. But uh, I don't know. We'll just go with it. And, uh, and then you flame the loop, put it in sector three, and maybe it's not shown here, and then come into sector two, where once again, the numbers of cells are diluted in sector two. They're most concentrated in this region. And then uh, you should go into sector two uh, at least three times to make sure you pick up cells. And then streak out sector three about 20 to 30 times. Uh, this works well when the organism isolated is at high numbers in the original population. If it's at very low numbers, you'd have to first put the cells through an enrichment culture to increase the incidence of the cells of interest. And here you could see we did have a uh, mixed culture. There are red colonies and yellow colonies. And for ob obtaining an isolated red colony, we could get an isolated red colony from here, but the yellow colonies, there's no isolated yellow colonies. So you'd have to grab from a yellow colony and then streak it out again for isolated cultures to get even a single colony. Now, like I said, to get a pure culture, you wanna do this two times. So for this red one here, we'd streak it out on a second plate, get an isolated colony, and then pick from that isolated colony and call that a pure culture. All right, when we're talking about microbial growth, remember it refers to the increase in the number of cells, not in the cell size. Bacteria tend to grow by three methods. Binary fission, where the cell literally splits down the middle in two, by budding, or by reproductive spores. Most bacteria reproduce by binary fission. Only a few reproduce by budding, and very few reproduce by reproductive spores. Uh, let me talk about the reproductive spores now because I don't think I have another slide of it. Come on. I'm not getting that to work. We usually have a parent cell, which is big and it'll be like that on the media, meaning it's it's up a little bit so that the wind or an animal can come by and, and pick up the reproductive spores. And it can put out some reproductive spores, usually on the far end. 
and there will be like four of them. The reproductive spores are smaller than the parent cell, and they're at the edge of the parent cell. And like I said, the point is for something to come along like the wind or an animal, pick up the spore, and then carry the spore elsewhere. So it can then go on and row over here. We'll just say the reproductive spore, and it'll germinate, forming a endospore, mainly not an endospore, and what do they call that? A vegetative cell. The vegetative cell will then go through normal growth and reproduction. And eventually it would uh, uh, have uh, reproductive spores of its own. I want to point out that the parent cell survives this procedure and it's producing four reproductive cells. So one cell to begin with will make five cells, the parent cell itself, and then the four reproductive spores. This is why a reproductive spore is a form of reproduction. Let me remind you, when a cell makes an endospore, one cell makes the endospore, and then after the parent cell dies, all you have is the one endospore. One to one is not reproduction, that is a survival strategy. All right, binary fission happens where the uh, chromosome of the bacteria will, will split into two, meaning you'll have one chromosome and it'll go through a DNA replication making two chromosomes. The two chromosomes will split, one moving to this side of the cell, one moving to that side of the cell. And then the cell literally forms a cell wall and a plasma membrane in between them the uh, nuclear, the, uh, the DNA molecules. And then that'll grow into both a cell wall and a cell membrane, which will totally separate the one cell into two cells. And then we'll have two daughter cells, which will go on their own way. Uh, here you can actually see a, an actual electron microscopic image of a cell that's in the process of uh, binary fission, splitting from one cell into two. But it has not totally finished that cell wall there, as well as the cell membrane. Any questions about binary fission? Most bacteria grow this way, the vast majority. A few bacteria can uh, grow by budding. This is where a parent cell We'll put out a small bud on one end of the cell, which will then grow. I guess that one will be the best one. And then grow. And will continue to grow until the bud becomes the same size as the parent cell. Any question about budding? Let's show a little video of that. The cell is going to put out a bud right there. There's the bud forming there. There, right in this area here, is where the DNA is moving into the bud. So the chromosome is replicated in the parent cell, and one copy is sent into the bud. And about right there, let's just stop that. About right there is where the bud is finally separated from the parent cell. And as you can see, this bud is close to the size of the parent cell. And now the uh, parent cell is going to put out a bud here. And the new cell is going to put out a bud there. Any questions about budding? A 
only a few bacteria do engage in budding. Uh, many yeast do bud. And actually, we were showing you a picture of yeast budding, not of bacteria. All right. When we're talking about the generation time, this is the time required for a cell to divide. And it's also the time for the population numbers to double. So from one cell growing into two is the same thing as a population of a thousand cells growing into 2000. That is the generation time. The generation time varies considerably between different species of microorganism. It can be as fast as 20 minutes. E. coli, when it's growing its fastest, can reproduce from one cell into two by binary fission. And it can do that in 20 minutes. So that is the generation time. Most bacteria have a generation time a little slower than that. Most can generate, meaning go through a doubling, in uh, one to three hours. Microbacterium leprae is the slowest bacteria to, uh, to multiply that I know of. And it takes 10 days for one cell to grow into two or for a population to double in its size. The reason why Microbacterium leprae is so slow is because it has mycolic acid in its cell wall. And so all of the Mycobacterium tend to grow slowly. And it's because the mycolic acid takes the cell a long time to make. Mycolic acid is a complex structure built on carbon. Any question about the generation time? All right, let me warn you that students often get confused on the generation time. It is the time per generation. So when we say E. coli has a generation time of 20 minutes, that per generation is understood. So we could have written it as E. coli has a generation time of 20 minutes per generation. Any question about any of that? All right, what students get wrong with the generation time is they will say the generations per hour. That is not the generation time. The generation time is the cell divisions per unit of time, meaning one generation time. Is that clear? I think it's from our saying, like so I'm, I'm, I'm driving 60 miles per hour. We're used to putting things in a unit measurement per time. And the generation is not that. It is the time per generation. Microbiologists like to graph the generation times on a semi-log plot. The reason for doing that is when you graph it on a semi-log plot, not only do you scatter the points much better than you would on an arithmetic plot, uh, and it's not shown here, but one cell goes into two, two into four, four into 16, 16 into 32. So most of the points are in this part of the graph, and then these points are far away from each other. And then the next point here won't be on the graph or even on the, the uh, web page. It'll be on the ceiling. With the uh, generation time graphed on a semi-log plot, you scatter all of these points here. And uh, the next point here can be on the graph. It'll be about here instead of on the ceiling. And then the real reason why microbiologists use it is this equation is very simple and easy to use. It's y 
equals mx plus b, meaning your answer for y is equal to x, whatever x is, times the m with the constant, and then plus b, that's the point where the graph intersects the y-axis. Uh, on a arith arithmetic plot, like I said, we have all the points down here. This one, the next one will be off the, the table. It will be off the graph. It'll be up on the ceiling. And then this equation is way more difficult to work with. It's not a simple chemical, a simple mathematical relation. I mean, it is, but it's much more complex than this one. Any question about any of that? All right, let's talk about the phases of growth. Bacteria curves tend to follow the same growth curve. And in fact, when you have any organism isolated in an environment, it will follow the same growth curve. And that is when you're first starting out, you have a lag phase. Like when you're growing your bacteria from a solid culture, and then you're growing it in a liquid culture, the bacteria are going to enter a lag phase. In the lag phase, what they're doing is they, the cells are getting ready for their new environment. So they won't be getting CO2 from the air. They'll be getting carbon from carbon in the sugar that's in the media. And to use that, like I said, the cells have to have, make the enzymes to do that, especially if they weren't using that sugar earlier. Uh, so the organisms are in a lag phase, getting the enzymes they need to grow in the new media. The growth then will be in the exponential growth phase where it'll rise steeply. That's because down here, there's few organisms, lots of media space. There's lots of nutrients in the media and uh, not very many microbes to use up that nutrient. And so the microbes grow very rapidly. However, once the population numbers increase, the growth will begin to slow and then it will plateau off and not ever increase or decrease, assuming you keep the cells at the same environmental condition. The reason for the stationary phase is, is that or the slowing of the growth, I guess I should talk about here first, is that there's fewer nutrients per cell now. There's fewer space per cell. Some cells that are lucky will have lots of space around them. Other cells that are unlucky have a bunch of other cells near them. And these other cells are competing with the nutrients for the cell of interest. The population then enters the stationary phase where the population number stays about the same. It does not increase any further, but it does not decrease. If we were to look at this with not a shield, but to look at it specifically, a case of it, what will happen is you'll have your, I don't know, archer. And initially the archer is reproducing because there's lots of resources around not very many cells to compete with. And then that'll slow when the uh, resources become harder to find. The uh, room around the cell will be partially blocked by other cells and uh, something about nutrients. Don't remember. Uh, anyways, the 
Population is stationary, meaning the population numbers do not increase, but they do not decrease. The reason why the population is stationary is because some cells are growing in the stationary phase. These will be the lucky cells that ha don't have much waste around them. They do have some nutrients around them and they have some space. So those lucky cells can grow. The unlucky cells on the other hand cannot grow and are in fact dying. And that's because they don't have much space around for them to grow. The nutrients may have been used up previously by other bacteria, or in this case, by the other wrestler. And the unlucky cells will begin to die because they have no nutrients, little space, too many waste products around them. Uh, the point is in the stationary phase is that death equals uh, birth or growth. Death equals growth. And so the population number stays the same because for every cell that's growing, we'll have a cell dying. Any questions about the stationary phase? All right, the stationary phase can't last forever. Eventually, the cells will enter the death or decline phase. I'll call it the death phase. Initially, when the cells first enter the death cell phase, the lucky cells can actually still be reproducing. There won't be many of them, but they will have some nutrients around them, not too many waste products around them, and a little bit of space. So these cells can reproduce. On the other hand, there's another type of... Uh, plant, which uh, doesn't like this new environment that has very little nutrients around, lots of waste products around, and then very little space. And so this other organism, let's say a plant, will then begin to die. In the death or decline phase, cells at least late in the phase, are not growing. They are only staying stationary or they are dying. Early in the death phase, you can have a few lucky cells which are growing, but there will be more cells dying than cells that are growing. So in the death phase, the total number of cells is decreasing with more time. Any question about any of that? All right, let's briefly talk about the measurements we have for measuring microbial growth. There are direct methods and indirect methods. The direct methods involve a plate count, filtration, the most probable number, and a direct microscopic count. There are also indirect methods, and these are using a turbidity meter to measure the number of cells. You can also measure the cells by performing a metabolic activity, or you can simply dry out the cells and then weigh them. And you can assume that most of the weight is coming from the microorganism, which uh, is the one that's supposed to be in the stock culture. Any question about any of that? I've used all of these methods for calculating the number of cells except the most probable number. I've never used that one. And yeah, I was using them to calculate the number of bacteria. The plate count, also called the most vi the, the viable plate count, is the most common method used in microbiology for obtaining an estimate of the number of cells. Uh, it does take this procedure 24 hours or more to plate the cells and then have the colonies grow up. So you do need to wait if you're using the viable plate count. 
And then the re results are often reported as colony forming units per mill rather than the number of cells per mill. And that's because we don't know how many of the colonies were formed from a single cell and how many were formed from a colony of multiple cells. I mean, uh, a machete that's capable of being using multiple times. Any question about any of that? All right. Uh, one important point about the viable plate count, also called the plate count, is it's called viable for a reason. And that is this method only counts living cells. It does not count a cell that is dead or dying. You have to have growth of the organism in order to get your cell counts. And then you use the cell counts to determine the number of cells per mill, or more specifically, the number of colony forming units per mill. In a plant plate count, you make several serial dilutions of the original sample. You then inoculate agar plates from each dilution as well as from the sample. And so you'll have a number of plates at different dilutions. And then you count the number of colonies on the plate. You want a count based upon uh, 25 to 250 colonies. Anything more than 250 colonies, you're going to have a hard time getting an accurate number. And so we don't use more than 250 in the viable plate count, because if it's more than 250, then the accuracy of your count will be off. And it's simply that if you have more than 250 colonies on a plate, it's just too many. You can't count them reliably because they start fusing into each other. And then you need to get your, your uh, plate meaning the colonies you count from a plate that have about 25 colonies or more. Uh, the reason if you're doing that, let me pull up. Actually, I can use Word, I think. Is if you have, uh, let me blow this up. Come on. If you have uh, one, oops, I didn't get that to work. One, still not working, sorry. I'm not sure what the problem is. Hmm. Might be just that the uh, Color is white for some reason. No. Nope. Oh, there we go. So you have one colony out of four. That means the mean is equal to one out of four. And that's plus or minus 25%. That should be a minus there. If it's one colony out of 40 colonies, it's not one out of four, it's one out of 40. And, oops. What the heck is that? So this will be 0.25. 0.25. And then plus or minus 25%. Uh, 
So this one is going to be equal to whatever 1 out of 40 is. I don't know what that is. Let me get a number here. So 0 0.025. Plus or minus, it's not 25%. Yep, come on. Now, why did that shrink? Um, one out of 40. will be plus or minus 0 0.025. Get rid of that underscore there. And the point is, is that, uh, oops, let's put this over here too. Come on. Uh, the point is, is that this mean has a much larger variation around it than this one. This one has a very small variation around it. Any question about that? So we want the mean which has less variation um, because it's a more accurate mean than this one here. Is that clear to everybody? Anyone confused about that? All right. Close that down too. So that's why you use uh, plates that have 25 to 250 colonies. Any less than 25 and your mean is not going to be very accurate any more than 250, and you're going to have a, a, an estimate, meaning you're not going to get an exact number of colonies on the plate because there's too many for them to count. So here we're doing the different dilutions. You start from your original solution, dilute it 1 into 10. That's the dilution 1 into 10. And then you put mix that up, put 1 mil into 9 mils, and you got your 1 in 100 dilution. Take Mix that up. Uh, take 1 mil, put it into 1 in uh, 9 mils, and that'll be 1 in 1,000 dilution, 1 in 10,000, 1 in 100,000. You then take a sample from each of these tubes of serial dilution and then plate it on uh, the auger. And I'm just going to discuss plating one mil because that's easier to discuss. And then the mathematics is also easier. If you plate one mil on uh, from the dilution and then spread out the, the media so it forms isolated colonies, you'll get something like this. Let me blow this up. Some of the dilutions will have too many colonies to count. That one, that one, even that one, too many to count. And then this one has, oh, I don't know, something like 30 colonies. And this one has like four colonies. You choose the count from this one because this mean will be more accurate than this mean. And then you base the uh, number of cells you get. So let's say this is 30. The dilution is 1 in 10,000. 
So you got 30 times uh, 10,000 over one. And what would that be? 30. So um, the original number of cells would be three. times 100,000, and that would be the uh, number of cells in your original sample before the dilution. Any question about any of that? Now that's assuming each colony here is formed by one cell. Like I said, it's more accurate to say that we have 30 colony forming units here and then the number of cells in our original inoculum is not, let's see, something like, uh, three, zero, zero, so 300,000 colony forming units per mil, meaning that this colony could be formed by a clump of cells. It may not be from one cell, and so we use the term colony forming units per mil. Any question about any of that? All right, this is one way to get an estimate of the number of cells in the original inoculation. Make a dilution, plate out your dilution, let it grow up, count the number of colonies, then multiply the number of colonies times your dilution to get your uh, number of colony forming units per mil in the original inoculum. That works well if the bacteria numbers are high. If the bacteria numbers are very low, that procedure would not work because even in your original inoculum, if you were to plate it, you would get maybe one colony on the entire plate. And what you do there, if you have very dilute uh, bacteria cells, like let's say you're sampling the number of bacteria in a city's drinking water, well, the numbers are not gonna be very high because we do not give drinking water, at least in America, that have bacteria in it. There will be some because microorganisms are everywhere, but there will not be a large number. And what you'd want to do is instead of trying to do a serial dilution and then a viable plate count, is you would pass a volume of liquid through a filter and then put the filter on an auger dish to allow the filter to grow the colonies on the auger dish. So you filter a given volume that has low numbers of bacteria, and this has to be a liquid that you're filtering or the uh, a gas. You can't filter a solid, but you could do it air if you were like filtering the number of bacteria in the air of the microbiology room. You pass it through a filter and then uh, throw it up on the disk. Any question about any of that? Uh, what you do is you simply count the uh, number of colonies on the disk, and then you have to take into fact that uh, you uh, took from more than one mil, let's say you're counting the number of bacteria in water, and you let's say you put in, oh, let's say one liter of water, and let's say you get 30 colony forming units. And I don't know what that would be because I have to work it out, but uh, that would be 30 colony forming units per liter of water in our water. And most of us don't drink a liter of water at one time. All right, so that's another way of getting a uh, a direct estimate of the number of cells, or in, in reality, a direct count. Uh, you can also do a direct microscopic count where you count the number of cells under a microscope. This has a slide, a special slide that has a 
measured volume of liquid placed under the slide, and then you count the number of cells. Let me show you the gridded slide. So there's the gridded slide. It has a specific volume under it. That volume is usually designed so that this big square under the microscope or under the grid will be whatever the count is. That's about 20 times a million, meaning that this would be one millionth of a, oh, I don't know, a milliliter. And so the number of microbes, if this is 30, I'm not going to count it. Uh, in fact, that's closer to 20, I would say. Let's say 20. The uh, number of microbes would be 20 20 million microbes per mil of our original solution. Any question about any of that? And there you can see the slide right there. It has a specific volume underneath that cover slip. And then the grid is uh, marked on the cover slip. And then you look under the cover slip. And like I said, normally what people do is they count what's in here, and then you just multiply by a million. Uh, this works well when you have dead cells, but if you have modal living cells, this procedure will not work because that cell could move over here before you get to it. And then that cell, after you count this one, could move in here. It doesn't work well either if you have capsules. The capsules tend to get in the way and make it difficult to count, although it can work with capsules because they won't move. But it does not work if the cells are moving. Anyways, this is a direct way of getting a microscopic count. Uh, it is fairly quick. It just takes you uh, time to put the sample under the gridded slide and then somebody to do the count under the microscope. It's a little hard on the poor schmuck's eyes who has to do the count, but like I said, you get your results pretty quickly. You don't have to wait a day for the cells to grow and form colonies. All right, so that's the direct methods I'm gonna talk about. I'm not gonna talk about the most probable number this is using mathematics to determine your number of cells. And I'm not familiar with this method because this is the one way I've never counted a uh, number of cells. I've done all the other ways. Uh, there are also indirect methods for getting a microscopic count. Turbidity, using a turbidity meter uh, by measuring the metabolic activity or by measuring the dry weight. Turbidity means you pass a light through the media and then you amount, uh, measure the amount of light getting through. And if you have microbes in the media, less light will get through. And then you see the change from here to there and then look up on a chart what this change means. And let's say that's a difference of 80 units and if you have to have a chart saying what, uh, how many bacteria they are, and what you do is you, to make this chart, somebody has to do many different uh, dilutions of the bacteria to make the chart. But once you have the chart made, you can then use the chart essentially forever. And if you have no cells, you'll look on the chart and you'll see, okay, it's, 100%, uh, that means I have zero cells. And if it's, I don't know, 90% of the light coming through, you look on it and you'd say, okay, that means I have, I don't know, let's say one times 10 to the fourth cells per mil. And uh, if you look at it at a number, another number, it'll be one times 10 to the fifth cells per mil and et cetera. And like I said, all you do is you take your, media containing the cells 
you have to have the uh, same media with uh, no cells in it and then do a comparison and the change will be a number and then look up what that number is on the chart and it'll tell you how many cells per mil you have. It's very rapid. Like I said, you grow your cells and then you just put it in the turbidity meter along with the media that has no cells in it. Any questions about the uh, turbidity meter? All right, you can also get an estimate of the bacteria numbers by metabolic activity. If you have more metabolic activity, you then can assume that you have more uh, cells. So if you're measuring the amount of CO2 being produced, you can get a number, let's say you got, oh, I don't know, one liter of CO2 released in one hour. You can go look on a chart and see how many cells you have for that one liter that was released in one hour. Okay, and you have to have a chart, but once you have the chart set up, you can uh, use it essentially forever. So you simply measure what you're measuring, like the amount of CO2, and then get an estimate of the number of cells based on your amount of CO2 produced. You can also do the dry weight, and this is uh, often done for uh, uh, filamentous bacteria or fungi because the, these are difficult to count under the, the microscope. Um, they might be able to do the viable plate count as long as you can get the cells to separate and be single cells, at least most of them. Uh, what else would not work? The Maybe the metabolic activity would not work. Uh, the turbidity meter would not work because the cells are, filamentous cells are in an unusual shape. So it would not work for your chart. You'd have to redo your whole chart working with that one species of bacteria that's filamentous. And so what people sometimes do is they will grow up the cells and then dry them and then weigh the dry weight. And you can obtain the number of cells for your dry weight. You have to look at the a chart having, if you have like, I don't know, one gram of cells, how many cells you have to make up one gram. But the nice news is that you can then use that chart forever. You don't have to throw it away. Although, no, actually, it would work with a filamentous uh, bacteria. Um, one problem with all of these methods, except for the viable plate count and the filtration method, is you're counting dead cells. In the dry weight, well, actually, you're not counting dead cells in the metabolic activity either. But in the turbidity meter, you're counting dead cells. In the microscopic count, you're counting dead cells. So many of these will count dead cells and not viable cells. Uh, the advantage of the dry weight is you can dry the cells and then weigh them at your leisure. It doesn't need to be weighed right away. All right, any question about estimates for obtaining our number of micro microorganisms present? Meaning estimating the bacterial numbers. All right, if there's no questions, let's uh, save this and end it, and I wanna begin our next lesson. Chapter eight, which we should be way on today. We're we're a little behind schedule. Chapter eight covers the genetics of microbes. As is usual, I give you a first slide. 
giving you the terms you should know, the major terms, not all of the objectives. Did you get all of the objectives? You should look at the objectives in your study guide. Uh, two, be able to describe DNA replication, RNA transcription, and protein translation. And three, be able to understand the different types of mutations. Any question about what we're going to cover in Chapter 8? If not, first we're going to talk about the structure and function of the genetic material. We'll talk about the flow of genetic information. We'll talk about DNA replication, RNA transcription, and protein translation. We'll then switch gears a little bit and talk about the regulation of bacterial gene expression, how that uses an operon. We'll then talk about uh, mutations, how the DNA can be mutated. We'll then move on to genetic transfer and recombination. And then we'll end this lesson on genetics, talking about genes and evolution. Any questions about what we're going to cover? All right. Genetics is the study of what genes are, how they carry information, how that information is expressed, and how genes are replicated. A gene is a segment of DNA that encodes a functional product. This product is usually a protein, but it doesn't have to be. It can also be an RNA. So some genes do only code for an RNA product, but most genes code for a protein product. Here we're looking at a chromosome, and all the different locations are where a gene is on the chromosome. And here we're looking at a chromosome here, and the DNA is wrapped up in the chromosome. And as you can see, we have gene one and gene two here on the DNA wrapped up in the chromosome. And this is probably a eukaryote cell because you'll know that there is some non-genetic information that is not encoding a gene in between gene one and gene two. And eukaryotes are that way, where they have non-coding DNA. Any question about any of that? All right. A little more terminology. A genome is all of the genetic material in a cell or in microbes in a cell or a, mi a microbe or an organism. The study of genomes is called genomics. We have two terms to discuss uh, about genes. There's the genotype, and these are the genes of an organism. Then, then there's the phenotype, and that is the expression of these genes. For example, the genotype of a person with blue eyes is an individual with uh, the lowercase b, lowercase b, genotype. On the other hand, an individual who has brownish eyes, and the eye color is the phenotype, the trait we're talking about, the uh, genotype for someone who has brownish eyes is the uppercase b, lowercase b, as well as uh, two uppercase b's, meaning uppercase b, uppercase b. So this is the genotype for an individual with brown eyes, and there's two of them, two genotypes possible. And uh, an individual with bluish eyes can only have one genotype, and obviously they only have one phenotype. The people with brown eyes only have one phenotype too. The phenotype is the trait you can see of the expression of the genes. The genotype is the underlying genes that we're talking about. In humans, we have generally two, two genes for each trait. And that's generally the case. I think there are a few exceptions, but generally we have two genes for each, um, each phenotype or each trait. 
And that's because you get one gene from your mother, one gene from your father. Any question about that? And I did say that's generally the case when we're talking about boys, for example, they get only the genes on the X chromosome from their mother and only the genes from their Y chromosome from their father. But boys are just a little bit of an exception. Uh, actually, girls are, are not the exception because they get all of their genes on the X chromosome from both their mother and their father. All right, any question about any of that? Sorry, I got a little bit complicated there talking about <laughs> genotypes. All right, here's looking at E. coli, and there you can see one chromosome coming out of E. coli, and uh, the DNA wrapped up in that chromosome, and that stretch there would probably have at least one gene, probably more. Let's go over there. Probably one gene right about there. So the genes are a region of the chromosome. And usually those genes do not move around. We will talk about an exception, a transposon later in this lesson, not today. Sorry, I had to talk about the complicated part. All right, DNA is a polymer of nucleotides. DNA is made up of adenine, thymine, thymine, cytosine, or guanine. And you can know these names, or you can just call them A, T, C, or G. Either way. DNA is a double helix of proteins, meaning DNA has two strands of DNA held together by hydrogen bonds and it's arranged in a double helix. The single strand of DNA is held together by the sugar phosphate backbone. We talked about that before. And then the two strands are held together by the hydrogen bonds between the uh, complementary uh, nucleotide uh, bases. The two strands are anti-parallel, meaning one strand is running this way. Let's go that way. And the other strand is running that way, meaning there's a five prime end on this side and a three prime end on that side. You don't need to know what the five prime and three prime refer to, but chemists have a way of numbering the carbons on all molecules, including sugar. And this would be the three prime carbon, meaning the third carbon, and this is the five prime carbon. Let's go right to there. So that's the fifth carbon, and that's why this is the five prime end. Any question about any of that? All right, if not, I'm going to end here. We didn't get very far, only six slides on this lesson, but we'll have to do. I will see you in the lab if you have questions. If you don't have questions, you do not need to show up in the lab. I'll only be there from 7 to 7.15 today. Thank you. Thank right. you. You're welcome. Have a good night. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.